Uh, for those who are following us online, please note uh, the, you, you have the option of going to the a different, I mean, to the session of your choice, and, and the technology allows you to do that. Please, please uh, do uh, choose the panel that you feel is most appropriate to you. The next thing I'd like to let you know is do send through the questions. We will definitely be in a position to respond to those questions. As, as you did notice, uh, even much as they came in late, it was, it was well received. So, um, I've been requested to invite the panel back for, for a group photo. Uh, so, Mr. McKay, Aum, uh, Edith, and uh, Will Broad, please do come here. Let's take a group photograph. And um, <laughs> apologies, Richard, for, for the record, we need to make sure that uh, we show our presence digitally. Um, so, Richard, please join. Um, Stella. Uh, so, so, so the other panelists who are here, let's have a group photograph. And um, Rukshana, please make it here as well as, as, as a co-moderator. I, I think we should show our faces. My assumption is that we are safe. We can briefly show our No one should stop you from finishing what's yours. That's why MTN gives you data bundles that don't expire. MTN Freedom Bundles using my MTN app and enjoy the freedom to finish your data bundles. MTN. Penicillin. Ethanol. Flour. Sugar. Glue. Whiskey. Corn silk. Starch. Oil. Livestock feed. All good afternoon. Corn. Good morning. Still, you discover I think. endless opportunities. Yes. Good morning, uh, everybody. Those who are here and those following us online. I'd like to invite the panelists to come up front for us to start. Would also like to confirm if uh, the panelists online can see and hear us. Great, I can also hear you perfectly. I don't know whether we'll have a visual of the person online. Great, I can see you, yes. Good morning. Good morning, Richard, and good morning, everyone. Great, so uh, please, uh, let's have Gerald and Doreen on, uh, on the stage. Okay, I think I'll join them and see. Once again, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here moderating this session today. My name is Richard Ndahiro. I work for the United Nations Capital Development Fund uh, in the Digital Economies Program. Today we are discussing, I think, a topic which is, I would say, um, at the right time. We were discussing, I mean, earlier there was a keynote and uh, speeches by the chairperson talking about the journey that FinTech has taken in Uganda. And indeed, FinTech is of, uh, has been there for a while. It's been recognized, and the regulation uh, of the sector is actually testimony to that. And I'd like to say that with age and with recognition also comes responsibility. 
And okay, just a second. I'm requested to move. So I was saying that uh, fintech in Uganda has come of age, and uh, with age comes responsibility uh, and also recognition. Part of that responsibility is to think through what the industry uh, brings in terms of its, its, its contribution to the economy, to the development agenda, to sustainable development, as we'll hear about the SDGs. And that's what we are trying to discuss today, the development impact of fintech in Uganda, what it is today, but what it ought to be. And the focus really will be thinking about the future and where the industry should be going and helping the economy grow towards a sustainable economy. So with us today, we have, I'll start with Doreen. Uh, Doreen Lukandwa, we know her at Bionic, but I also read somewhere that she's now VP MFS. Tell us a bit more about that. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the Vice President for Global Enterprises at MFS Africa. What that means is I'm driving the expansion um, of use of digital payments, specifically for enterprises, those that um, want to scale within Africa and those within Uganda that want to scale beyond the borders of Uganda uh, to transact with businesses outside uh, the, the country. Thanks, Don. We also have uh, Mr. Gerald Begumisa. He's the CEO of Yo Uganda, well-known fintech in, uh, in Uganda. The last time I checked, uh, you called yourselves one of the leading fintechs in the country. Is that still the case? Well, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Richard. So I, I'll, I'll comment on that, that when, when we started, well, we were the first to launch a, an online payment gateway. But the industry has come quite a long way, and there are several fintechs who are doing quite amazing things, as we shall discuss in this conversation. So as Richard has said, I'm Managing Director at Yo Uganda Limited. My name is Gerald Begumisa. Uh, we are 16 and a half year old fintech, so we started in 2006. And uh, we started our fintech journey in 2010. That's when we, we launched our payment gateway. And we've also been uh, privileged to have partnered with the UNCDF in achieving certain goals of, of, of key importance, such as digitization of agricultural value chains, which has impacted hundreds of thousands of farmers and, and so on in the rural areas of Uganda. So I'm very happy to actually be part of this panel. Thanks, Gerald. Always good to have you. And online joining us from Paris is uh, Mr. Ayaz Mita, a man of many hearts, emerging markets, fintech expert, but also digital ambassador at UNCDF. What haven't I said, uh, Ayaz, about you? Tell us. Thank you, Richard. That's very, very generous. I think the only thing I would add is in the last few years, uh, my focus has really been at the intersection of FinTech and sustainable development goals and how FinTechs and digital finance in general really supports the SDGs um, that goes beyond financial inclusion uh, beyond financial health, but really in looking at ways in which FinTech can actually accelerate um, the financing for the SDGs, and I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Ayaz. And I'd like to kick off from there, really, in uh, you helping us set the scene for that intersection between FinTech and sustainable development, the new thinking around that, with the work you've done under the UN. Uh, if you could kick us off with uh, setting the scene on that. Thanks, Richard. So, so obviously, a lot of the work I'm doing right now is inspired from the UN Task Force on Digital Financing for the SDGs, which was set about three years ago to really identify and catalyze ways in which uh, FinTech could accelerate financing for the SDGs. And um, it might seem obvious to all of us today that FinTech is already playing a key role in supporting sustainability and sustainable development. It would be impossible to have a trillion dollars of green bonds globally if real-time rapid data flows and use of proceeds were not becoming the norm, or it would be impossible to have carbon market scaling without the underlying fintech infrastructure. But perhaps a bit closer to home in, in Uganda, for example, fintech is enabling in many ways access to capital-intensive utilities with pay-as-you-go models that allow people and households to access portable solar home systems 
to sharing economy models that allow farmers, for instance, to start sharing tractors and expensive agricultural equipment to all sorts of other fractionalized payments-based fintech models that really allow people to start accessing a whole range of products and services in ways that were not possible before. And that's because fintech enables low cost of transaction, uh, fractionalized payments at very effective um, rates and affordable ways, but also aggregation. And perhaps on the finding side, in terms of the things that I see that are starting to happen in the fintech space in relation to sustainability, there's three areas that I wanted to mention on the finding side. One area is that fintech is really bringing new powerful ways of driving mobilization of financing for sustainable development in new ways. So for instance, think of a government that wants to be financing um, sustainable infrastructure projects, be it a bridge, a hospital, a school, just sustainable low carbon infrastructure development projects. Usually what a government does is that it actually borrows the money from international financial capital markets. So the majority of it comes from international aid and from international borrowing. And the cost of international borrowing on average is 15 to 20% more expensive than the cost of domestic financing, of course. Now, one of the ways in which FinTech could actually help is in, in supporting the aggregation of tens of millions of small amounts from small mobile money accounts. Think about, about just 10,000 shillings, small amounts, but FinTech can actually aggregate those small amounts across tens of millions of mobile money accounts and aggregate them into a single mega fund that becomes an investable pool that can be now channeled towards financing some of these infrastructure projects. And people, in that case, would be able to decide to opt in. They would be able to decide what infrastructure they want to be financing, if they want to finance a school or a hospital for the local community, or if they want to be financing a bridge for the local community because that's more important to them. And they would be getting the benefit of use, and they would also be getting dividends uh, from that investment as investors in it. So that's one way in which FinTech can actually drive new ways of mobilizing financing for development finance, but also empowering people to be part of the process, to be part of decision making, to be part of investment, uh, and to be part of uh, using and benefiting from that infrastructure um, with, with very small ticket sizes to enter. So it's really available to everyone and inclusive. I'm talking about 10,000 shillings. It could be as low as 5,000 shillings. So someone that has a little bit of balance on a mobile money account could participate. So that's sort of one example. The second example, and I don't want to be too long, uh, is really in terms of how do we think about allocation of financing towards more sustainable practices and sustainable outcomes through FinTech. So today, for instance, there's a lot of agricultural lending uh, to smallholder farmers in Uganda that's happening uh, by analyzing alternative data sets. We are looking at, of course, payments within the agricultural supply chains. We're looking at mobile money transactions and making credit decisions. MFIs are already doing that, for instance, uh, in Mawojo, uh, central Uganda. Now, if we wanted to use more fintech for sustainability in that context, and we know that reforestation uh, is a major priority in Uganda, or deforestation is a major challenge, and we know that the National Forestry Authority is actually focusing on reforestation efforts, we could think about fintech actually also bringing in additional data sets uh, from remote sensing and satellite imagery. Through satellite data and imagery, we can determine if a particular farmer is actually deforesting around its plot and then its small, small farm. Uh, we can use soil scanners to measure the level of uh, use of the soil and how intensive that is and, and whether soil is being damaged by the farmer by using bad practices. We can use sound scrapers to analyze the sound of human activity around the farm. We can capture the sound of natural elements in terms of wind and rainfalls around the farm. We can capture the sound of biodiversity around the farm, the sound made by animals and how that evolves in time. And all of that could feed into a machine learning algorithm that decides to give better loans with better terms to farmers that are more respectful of biodiversity around them. So that's one way of using FinTech also in the allocation of funding, not so much the mobilization, but allocating towards more sustainable practices. But we could also apply that to each trans products. So think about a safe Boda rider or someone who's actually a passenger of safe Boda. If I am getting on a safe Boda today and I want to take an insurance product, 
that protects me just for the 20 minutes ride that I'm going to take from point A to point B on the same model? What prevents me from having access to it? FinTech today can actually offer and enable those type of hyper granulated insurance products that will allow people to use insurance just for protecting themselves, uh, which is a way of allocating resources to the right sort of uh, outcome uh, in a very micro granulated way in a sense. So that's sort of a second area. And maybe the third area, and I will end there, Richard, unless you have follow-up questions, is really that on, on, the, on the work that the task force has made, we found that digital finance and fintech is really going to be beneficial if it puts people back at the center of decision-making about how they want their money to be invested, to be spent on the right outcomes. We know, for example, that 60 to 70 percent of carbon emissions and climate mitigation is a major global challenge today, as I am sure it is a priority in Canada. We know that 60 to 70 percent of carbon emissions are directly or indirectly linked to consumption. Now, if people that consume had in an app the ability to understand the carbon content or the plastic content of what they are consuming, and they were able and empowered to make more sustainable choices in ways that are important to them according to their values, we would be able to direct the $60 trillion of annual consumption globally towards more sustainable consumption patterns, in a sense. So putting people at the center and also empowering them through information, and we know that there's a range of carbon calculators already available. We know that ride hailing services like Save Bodas, and I'm not sure about the status of Save Boda, and I'm sorry, I'm just saying Save Boda, I should say Boda Boda, I'm not promoting the brand. But in other markets, I know that ride hailing services are also starting to shift towards electric vehicles, for instance, and electric motorbikes where that's possible. How do we incentivize users to actually shift to those means of transportation or those products and those goods that are less polluting in terms of their carbon footprint and their plastic content? That would be available to FinTech as well, all the way from supply chain tracking to measurement of carbon impact and plastic impact, all the way to actually providing the interface for users at the moment of choice and the moment of payment to actually choose the, the more environmental friendly option in a sense. So both in terms of mobilization, in terms of allocation, but also in terms of uh, deployment and choices, FinTech in many different ways can actually empower choices and enable choices that are more environment and um, sustainability friendly. And these are sort of the new trends and new ways in which FinTech can really help. And there's many examples of that starting to happen in Uganda, but it could be amplified um, on a considerable scale. So we'll just uh, hand it over back to you. Um, uh, thanks. Um, these, uh, few comments were helpful. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ayaz, for really giving us sort of projecting us into what's possible with fintech. And please stay there because there are more questions that will be coming your way. I'd like to get to the pioneer in the industry, Gerald. Um, when we look at fintech today, it has come of age. It's still majority driven by payments. But you'll agree with me that the future would be beyond payments into other areas that improve the livelihoods of the people, other areas that could be more development, uh, uh, more impactful uh, for development. What does this look like for you, not just as your Uganda, but the industry? What, what do you see as the next frontier for FinTech in line with the development impact that has been projected by IELTS? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Richard. So indeed, uh, fintech has come quite a long way in terms of uh, the solutions and innovations that have been done in the payment space. Quite a lot has been done. It started with, of course, the person-to-person pay -person payments, one person sending to another, person to business, government, and so on. Indeed, quite a lot has been done there. But one thing I should actually mention is that whereas a lot has been done, there are still significant gaps in the payment space. The most obvious one that comes to mind, which I think is a huge opportunity, is actually offline payments, which can complete transactions as quickly as a person getting cash out of their pocket. One of the things with uh, online traditional uh, electronic payments is that they simply can't match the time that cash transactions take. A cash transaction is almost instant. 
So I think there's a huge opportunity. Whereas a lot has been done in payments, I think there's a huge opportunity in the space of offline payments. And some of the applications would include things like public transportation. I think a number of us have experiences with uh, taxis and buses, and it, it might be a bit difficult to convince the conductor to hold on and wait for the SMS confirmation that the payment has been made. But this could be solved with an offline payment that is almost instant. It's electronic, but instant. So aside from that, there are a number of areas where a lot of fintechs have done quite, quite a lot of work. And I would, the first I would mention is the lending space. I think there's been a lot of development in this, and I would see it as one of the fastest growing areas. Uh, from our position as a, a payment processor, we are able to actually see some of these trends, and lending has, been quite, uh, uh, has experienced quite phenomenal growth. The other area I would mention is insurance, both traditional and micro-insurance. There are also huge opportunities there. A lot also has been done. There have been partnerships between um, uh, mobile operators and uh, insurance providers to offer micro-insurance solutions. Another interesting area is regulatory compliance. And to speak a bit about this, when the new law came into effect, uh, obviously as a fintech we had to read through the law itself and read through the regulations. And I found myself actually going to Google Sheets and opening a Google Sheet and starting to list all of the things that we have to be compliant with, broken down by whether it's weekly compliance or monthly or annually. And so I see a huge opportunity for solutions to be built along these lines to help fintechs comply, not only fintechs, but even other institutions who play in the financial sector, like, like banks, because even regulations relating to banks are increasing. So I, I see opportunities for solutions to be built that would enable um, quick and easy and painless compliance. There are also opportunities in identity verification, which is uh, quite an interesting area. There are a number of, of customers who have approached us and said they are ready to onboard with our services if we can give them a way of giving them 100% comfort about their identity of individuals. So there are people who are ready to, to offer lending to the general public if they can actually be 100% sure of identity. So this, I think, is an area that would, that would actually see quite a bit of growth. There's a lot of work that has already been done in this space. I know there are companies that are offering solutions where you simply send them a photograph of an identity card, regardless of which country, or whether it's a passport, driver's license, and it will attempt to, to estimate the validity of that, but there is still a huge gap in this space. Speaking more towards the SDGs and so on, I think fintechs are already doing a number of things which, which help to move us closer towards the achievement of various SDGs like poverty, SDGs related to poverty, health, education, and as, as I, I has mentioned, fintechs are in unique positions to create solutions that previously were not possible. For example, solutions that leverage microtransactions. And one sector I would, I would highlight here is the energy sector. Uh, solar, or clean energy, is traditionally quite expensive and was historically the preserve of uh, people who had sufficient resources to buy the solar panels and to buy the solar systems. But with the emergence of fintechs who have created solutions that allow a pay-as-you-go service, so there are some who offer a pay-as-you-go service where you only pay for what you use, and there are others who offer a service where you make micro or small payments towards eventual ownership of the solution. So this actually has brought uh, clean energy options, which were previously a preserve of the more well-to-do to, to the masses now. I mean, with, with payments which are as low as 500 shillings or 1,000 shillings, which is a fraction of a dollar on a weekly basis, this, this really brings such into the hands of the, the, the masses. Even in the education sector, there is a lot of work that has been done. I know some fintechs in Uganda who are offering solutions, which, which I mean, if, if I take a step back, previously when you are paying school fees, the school would tell you which bank to go to. And... Um, in my case, for example, in the 90s, there would be very long lines. So you would have to go quite early before the bank opens, line up, and then pay. But now there are fintechs who are offering solutions that allow you to pay uh, school fees in any bank. 
So regardless of, of which bank you pay in, the money finds its way to the school, which is quite helpful in the education sector. There are also fintechs that are enabling um, schools, universities, to receive fractional payments and track them. Um, in my opinion, I don't think that these education institutions would be averse to those solutions, to, to, to fractional payments. The big issue has mostly been tracking. How does the school bus uh, track that uh, parent X has only paid 20% and next week the next 10% is due? So because of this difficulty, a number of institutions have simply said, no, you just pay either the entire amount of school fees or you pay half of it. Basically something which they can work with with the, the skills that they have. But with fintechs offering solutions that allow these fractional payments and allow quite seamless and easy tracking of the payments, um, this has really advanced the, the options which educational institutions can, can give. I think I'll pause there for a bit. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Gerald. And you've stressed one of the new words I learned today, which is fractionalization of of, of payments and uh, and enabling new business models and ways of, of, of serving people. To MFS, uh, MFS Africa, you're already looking at the future of going beyond payments. You've entered into all sorts of sectors, but all this being enabled by primarily what you've done in the payment space. If you could take us through some of the new things you're doing or what you see as the future of your business in line with um, impacting uh, society, the economy uh, sustainably. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, the way I see it is that without custom solutions to specific day-to-day -day challenges, um, total financial inclusion and achievement of the SDGs will remain a myth. It's one thing to acquire a subscriber. It's another thing to retain an active user. And so fintechs play the role of the enabler, right? They are the bridge between, um, or actually the layer on top of existing digital payments infrastructure, um, deepening and extending the access of digital payment solutions, um, while ultimately increasing the lifetime value of that customer by customizing solutions that address specific needs. And I think um, ultimately Bionic has become a part of, of MFS Africa. Um, and MFS Africa as a group has supported over 320 million unique customers to transact, to send money from where they are uh, across 30, 33 markets in Africa um, and, and ultimately across the, the globe. And so where Bionic comes into play and it's kind of baked into the name, Business Beyond Cash, is sort of targeting and, and developing a specific solution for SMS, MSMEs taking them all the way beyond the day-to-day -day challenges of cash transactions into digital payments, not only limited to the confines of their domestic markets, um, but connecting them to other markets across Africa and ultimately the globe. And so how Bionic has kind of complemented the achievement of these SDGs is enabling the ability to integrate with multiple vendors. Um, so I've, you know, as, as the pre previous speakers have mentioned, You've talked about things like agriculture, microcredit, ETC, um, and, and, K and things like KYC. So creating a platform that allows you to integrate with, you know, sort of biometric solutions where required, card solutions where required, um, sending payments to users who are using a feature phone or a smartphone. So it's pretty much vendor agnostic and sector agnostic. And so to speak to some of the use cases that we have kind of extended these services to beyond payments. Uh, we are supporting partners like One Acre Fund that is extending one um, microcredit and, and quality inputs to over one million farmers across uh, the sub-Saharan Africa. You think of names like uh, 4G Capital that is extending microcredit to, to MSMEs who otherwise would not have qualified for credit, who otherwise would not have had the opportunity um, to grow their businesses. You think of examples like Infectious Disease Institute, which is in the health space, which is able to, in a period like this, remotely extend medical services to people across the country um, and ultimately to neighboring uh, countries. And then other 
NGOs, for example, like uh, Save the Children and some of the USAID projects that have come in very handy in providing relief in terms when refugees need it. So I think those are just some of the examples that speak to how um, MFS Africa and how Bionic has taken the use case of business beyond cash um, and ultimately enabling um, the acceleration for uh, achievement of the SDGs. Thanks a lot, Doreen, for yeah taking your business beyond cash, definitely already setting your foot into moving beyond payments, leveraging the payments to enter into various sectors that are not necessarily just finance. Um, I'd like to get back to Ayaz, but just before that, I'd like to encourage um, the listeners online. You can send your questions online and we'll be able to attend to those. Uh, questions to any of the panelists or uh, any contributions you might have. So, so back to Ayaz, you projected to us what's possible with fintech and uh, its, its impact to, towards sustainable development. Of course, potential and uh, possibilities are always there. The question is always how to realize the potential. What might be holding the industry today from realizing that potential? What needs to happen for that potential to come forth soonest? Over to you. That's, um, thank you, Richard. That's a very difficult question because the, the answer will really, really depend uh, on, on the markets you're considering. But I think uh, if you look at the constraints that fintechs uh, and digital finance innovators are facing um, in, in general across many markets, and that's true for a lot of African markets as well, and perhaps to a certain extent true uh, based on my limited experience in Uganda, uh, is access to capital. Uh, and obviously, depending on who your investors are, whether they're purely commercial for profit or whether they're impact investors, that to a certain extent is going to drive your plans in terms of how much SDG focus you're going to be or how much profit focus you're going to be. And fortunately, more and more investors are now are pushed to consider impact and sustainability as a key indicator of their performance and they are reporting on it. But I would say access to capital is a challenge, particularly at very early stages. Um, and obviously, along the way, that's going to determine your trajectory as a fintech entrepreneur in terms of what you're going to be focusing on. Um, the other aspect is, and we've spoken about that a little bit, is policies and regulations uh, that need to be enabling, of course. And in Uganda, they are enabling in many different ways. Um, you know, open APIs, open banking are possible, digital lending is possible. There's a lot of things that can be done now in Uganda which are really extraordinary in a sense. So that, that's a great development. Uh, in the blockchain space, where there's a lot of innovation happening, uh, particularly uh, around environmentally friendly innovations in many different ways, I think there's um, still more enablement that might be needed. So regulations are going to play a key role in enabling this. And of course, fintechs will need the market uh, to be able to thrive. They need the customers, in a sense. And in that regards, it's not just um, financial institutions and the financial sector. I think the government also plays a significant role in consuming those fintech innovations and bringing them in. There's many functions within the government um, that, that uh, could be supported by fintech. Uh, procurement processes, uh, you know, fund, funding allocation processes. There's many government functions that through fintech could be more effective, more transparent. Um, more uh, more open in many different ways. And so adopting FinTech uh, solutions within governments could also be a, a strong sign and a strong support to FinTech innovators to be able to actually see that there is a potential market. And obviously then there's a whole thing that needs to be put in place around uh, exportation of those FinTech solutions, I think. And the ICT sector in general, but FinTech innovations in particular, uh, if a fintech innovation, innovator in Uganda knows that there's a support system around them, not just to access the Ugandan market, and there's incentives, fiscal incentives, uh, policy incentives, etc., but there's also a whole plan to allow them to export their solutions to East Africa and beyond East Africa, and this is all facilitated and supported by government, that would be extremely helpful. So these would be sort of a few key things that I see um, that would be important. And lastly, Incentivizing uh, fintech innovations that are actually contributing to positive uh, growth and to sustainability. I mean, we know that there's a lot of innovations around online gambling, for instance, which is in a way fintech, 
Is online gambling good for people and good for sustainability? I'm not sure. This is a personal decision for each individual and for society to make. But incentivizing positively those that really contribute to sustainable growth is going to be also important in making sure that we steer the fintech ecosystem towards the right objectives and the right outcomes. Uh, this would be my few uh, initial reactions, uh, Richard. Thank you. And thanks, Ayaz, for talking to towards um, a lot that needs to happen within the ecosystem to steer the the the, the industry towards sustainable development. And I'd like to hear from Gerald uh, your thoughts about you. T you talked about the potential, what's already happening, but there's already also a lot of potential that is yet to be tapped. So I'd like to hear from you, and this is from the industry perspective of. When, when we talk of steering the industry towards sort of these more impactful uh, areas when it comes to development, what needs to happen within the industry, but even broadly within the ecosystem? Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. And um, I think one, one of the things I, I, I could point out, and this is also based on uh, our experience, is uh, partnerships partnerships with development partners, such as the UNCDF itself, the FSD. Um, another one is the US ADF, who recently we've been engaged with. And what uh, these partnerships bring is the ability to de-risk some of some certain ventures, which a fintech on its own might not see as a very profitable venture based on their, their projections of, of the the periods which they want to see their returns because most fintechs or oh, as long as they are for profit most of them are profit motivated and depending on the amount of capital runway if i may may call it that they might make certain decisions which or they might be pushed towards making certain decisions which may not necessarily uh, steer the industry in in the direction of for example solving the, the sdgs but with a partnership with a development partner, like, uh, for example, the UNCDF, would provide that runway or that capital that is necessary for them to operate or keep in business until they break into certain untapped areas. And one of, one of these, obviously, is uh, the agricultural sector or even the rural value chains. Most fintechs, I mean, when they start business, they will look for the most profitable area. And they will not choose between... Uh, for example, an online gaming uh, system and uh, and perhaps maybe uh, an agriculture institution based based on the SDGs. Most likely, they will they will make a selection based on which is which customer is able to bring them the returns in the quickest possible way. And so, with such realities or such pressures that fintechs experience, uh, depending on their levels of capital. I think partnerships with development partners would really help to, to, to reduce, reduce the pressure to get a return next year or the pressure to get, to get a return next month and, and as such help in guiding the industry towards some of these uh, objectives which are more long-term and of, of broader benefit. Then to just re something that I has said and that is government taking up solutions. I think uh, from the perspective of, of for-profit companies, um, either you look for sufficient capital to to implement the solutions that that you're you're working on uh, without going out of business before they start making a return, or you get customers as quickly as possible. And I, I see the government as as one of the most strategic customers that fintechs could have, and this in itself would provide some sort of feedback loop where. The fintechs actually benefit from business from government. They end up hiring more people on long-term basis rather than uh, the, the shorter terms which a lot of uh, capital-constrained fintechs might look at. So they hire people on longer-term basis. As a result of the proceeds that they get from this business, they pay more taxes. The staff who they've hired actually also pay taxes, which result in a wider tax base and general prosperity. So I see actually the government as one of the biggest drivers of the success of the industry and also the promotion of innovation in the industry. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Gerald. It's something I need to ask, which comes from uh, the submission here, but also what you mentioned a bit. The partnerships mentioned are mainly with development partners. 
some of the of the partners you mentioned also were majorly development partners. Does this suggest that this is an area where partnerships with private sector or government or none uh, would say development partner type of partners, if that is English, is not possible? Uh, is there business, pure tangible business in uh, impactful areas of, uh, of, 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 of fintech or does it have to be sort of being incubated, accelerated by development sector for it to make sense? And we'll start with you, Doreen. Yeah, no, I, I strongly believe that there is a business opportunity in the SDG space, um, based on your question. And ultimately, based on, on what um, Gerald and, and the other panelist has said, it, it's actually born from these different types of collaboration and government being at the center of it, or regulators being at the center of it. Because um, speaking from the perspective of, of MSMEs, for every business you're looking for an addressable market, you're looking for customers. So enabling any business to be able to reach as many customers as is possible is going to come from these different types of collaboration. And therefore in turn being able to create and generate the kind of revenue uh, and job opportunities that would fuel any economy, that would fuel any business. And so ultimately the role that fintechs are playing is developing those custom solutions that are taking advantage of existing tools available within, let's say within Uganda for instance, um, and accelerating that and, and refining that and, and tailoring in terms of cost, in terms of KYC for the specific target audiences. So speaking to some of the sectors that I mentioned, you look at an example like Rocket Health. Um, during a time when everybody else was kind of stagnant, Rocket Health picked up the mantle and ran with it because as a fintech, they were able to quickly um, adapt and switch up and remotely serve customers who needed healthcare um, in the most affordable way. But also riding on different types of partnerships, whether it be with border border riders um, and things like that. So it goes well beyond just social impact. From social impact comes the opportunity to create um, more business opportunity, more revenue streams, more job opportunities, and therefore more economic empowerment. Thanks, Doreen. And uh, uh, we are open to the audience for any questions, be it uh, those that are here with us or those online. So feel free to take the mic or send your question online. If not, I will keep monopolizing the question area of this uh, discussion. Maybe to get to Ayaz again, I, I asked the question around, of course, a lot of this thought is driven by the development sector, but do you have any examples of, um, if I may say, initiatives or businesses that are not really driven by development sector and that are already impacting some countries or... Uh, reaching scale beyond borders that, that we can learn from. I know you mentioned a few earlier, but where there is no UNCDF involved, for example, there is no development partner involved. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Richard. So I can give a few examples. I mean, of course, there's plenty. Uh, the exciting thing about FinTech and the new generation of entrepreneurs and innovators is that they are very much uh, socially, economically, environmentally uh, focused and minded. Uh, and interested and inclined. And there's a lot of things happening uh, in the space that really supports the SDGs. I can give one example uh, in which UNCF is not involved at all, but I don't know if you are familiar with Ant Forest, which is an app that's integrated in China into the uh, Alibay interface. So potentially any mobile money provider could actually integrate that sort of app in their mobile money platform. And what, what happens is that they have actually modeled 18 behaviors that people uh, go through every day from, you know, how I move myself around, whether I'm using a bike, I'm using a car, I'm walking, I'm using a bus, to other choices that they make on a daily basis. And depending on the choices they make, the more sustainable the choices, the more they earn green energy points. So if you're making sustainable choices, you have this app on your mobile money interface, uh, which is called Ant Forest as an app, you earn your green energy points and you start accumulating them. And then there's a virtual online game 
in which you can actually participate and use your green energy points to start building uh, forests and planting trees and planting uh, plants and flowers, etc., in virtual forests and virtual gardens. And as you start doing that, there's a whole gamified approach that's uh, exciting. It allows you to start playing, competing with others, and building your own forest, etc. In real life, there's actual trees that are being planted for you as you do that on the online game using your green energy points. And when that tree gets planted, you actually get a picture of where it's planted, a picture of the tree as it grows, and it belongs to you, uh, so to speak. It doesn't really belong to you, but sort of you're the godfather of that tree, let's put it that way, and you get an image of that. Now, in five years' time, they've been able to plant over 300 million trees in China by engaging 500 million users with that app on their platform. And they started exporting it in uh, the Philippines, uh, there's been a project with the DRC for Chinese users to start planting trees in the DRC. So that's one example uh, where it's actually really reached massive scale and people through making green actions get additional benefit in actually planting trees. They get the social reward, they get social recognition within their networks for being uh, responsible and for actually contributing to planting trees. So that's a good way of engaging people. So that's one example. There's plenty of examples in the blockchain uh, crypto conservancy space as well, where you know digitalizing um, uh, elephant carbon or whale carbon allows you to actually participate through a token by buying a token into restoring into restoration and conservation efforts in relation to protecting that whale or protecting that elephant, and you're basically buying the equivalent of elephant carbon or um, whale carbon that you want. Uh, against your contribution, in a sense. And so you're sort of uh, uh, being carbon responsible, in, in a way. So there, there's multiple, and I could spend hours talking about this, but I, can't, I don't want to monopolize the discussion. But I think that's sort of a few examples that are illustrative of really the significant potential in that space. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Ayaz. And that really helps us to sort of also open up to the possibilities of uh, of what innovation could look like for the country. And as we get towards the end of this, I don't know whether I should ask the question specific to what your Uganda, what we can expect from your Uganda in going towards uh, this type of business, or whether you'll speak from uh, the industry at large. If you were to project the next three to four, five years, what might you see emerging? I know this is off script, but innovate in your mind. Um, where do you see, what could we expect to see coming up in the next few years within this space of get, seeing fintech going towards uh, areas of more uh, impact for the economy? And, and Doreen also be ready to answer that. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. So, um, perhaps one of the things uh, I'll mention is. Um, is there has been quite a lot of investor interest in the fintech space. I mean, just probably last week or the other week, a $200 million investment was, was announced for some uh, f an African fintech called Wave, I think based in, in, in Senegal. Before that, there was, there, there, I, I can list probably about four or five investments upwards of $100 million. So there's quite a lot of, of interest. But one trend which which I think is clear is that a lot of these investments have targeted fintechs who focus on solutions for the general public or consumers. But there's also this other huge space of business to business fintechs. Fintechs who offer solutions to other businesses, which I think is a new area that we shall also start seeing a lot of investment coming into. It's, I mean, it's quite interesting that I was once browsing the internet and uh, I saw that Samsung is probably uh, Apple's biggest supplier, multi-billion dollar supplier to Apple. So there is a huge multi-billion business to business relationship between Samsung and Apple. But who would know? Most people are interested in, in, in the solutions that impact the general public or consumer solutions. But there is a very huge enterprise space where I see quite a lot of opportunity. So I do see quite a bit of growth happening in the enterprise space. And even as the consumer space grows, Speaking as uh, your Uganda, we've traditionally been more in the enterprise space, and that's why uh, we, we really do quite a lot. We really do a lot of uh, above-the-line marketing, but 
speaking for us, we see ourselves as also launching solutions that impact consumers because that is not a space that we have traditionally been into. So there are some things that we are working on along those lines. Thank you. Thanks, Gerald Doreen. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, as, as a business, as MFS Africa Group, the vision is that as easy as it is for you to pick up the phone and call somebody is how easy it should be for you to make a payment for whatever service you need in whatever sector. Um, and of course, that comes along with the necessary impact around the SDGs. And so the future for us is creating a, a hub that harmonizes all these different target audiences, whether it is P2P, uh, you're working in Uganda and you need to send money home to the US or to the UK, wherever you may be from, that you can do that as simply and as easily as you can make a phone call. Or even if you are in Kampala and you want to send money to Karamoja, you can do that as easily as picking up a phone and making a phone call. So ultimately for us, it's to make borders matter less, whether that be through individuals um, or through MSMEs that allow us to target not just one individual, but multiple. For every business you're speaking to about easily 100 to millions of, of, of individuals, and thereby making them um, more attracted to digital financial solutions. So we aim to be the enabler, the empowerer, um, the tool of choice for any business, for any, in any individual in Africa that wants to connect to the world and across the world that wants to connect into Africa. Thanks, uh, thanks, Doreen. And um, we are getting to the end of this. I'll, I'll give a round of uh, parting, um, parting shots to everybody. We've gone through a discussion that has taken us through what fintech can do in trying to enable new ways of mobilizing financing, be it for government, being for businesses, be it for individuals. We've gone through new ways of allocating financing. There were examples around how fintech can actually nudge people towards allocating financing to more sustainable uh, uses. We talked about fractionalization, if I'm saying it right, that's a new word to me, granulated products, impacting consumption uh, patterns of people and consumption choices. To, to wrap this, and I'll start with the CEO, Gerald, if you were to, to talk to government, to development partners, but to the innovation uh, sector, fintech majorly, what can we do to further this discussion for people to be more aware about what impact they can create uh, through their innovations to contribute more to what matters for the economy in a sustainable way? Yes, thank you very much, Richard, and thank you for the great moderation. O one thing I should uh, say is that as I sit here, I'm actually wearing two hats. So I'm the managing director at Yo Uganda, but I'm also a board member of FITSPA, which is the FinTech Association in Uganda. I think one of the, the things I should highlight to FinTechs out there who probably are not part of FITSPA is to join join the association. There are a lot of discussions we have around issues that face uh, fintechs, whether it be regulation, uh, raising capital, and so on. And that, that's one thing that we found quite helpful in terms of the, um, the opportunities we have to speak as a collective voice, as opposed to each fintech trying to fight their own specific battles. So through the work that the association is doing, I believe that... Um, that, they, that, that through this collective voice that we have as, as fintechs, we would be able to help influence the direction or the thinking of uh, government, regulators, and so on. I mean, if we as, as Yo Uganda went to, say, a development partner or even the government to propose something, we would be looked at purely through the lens of a for-profit business who is, looking at, who is looking at a return in the short, shortest possible time. But it, would, it could be looked at in a broader sense and thus creating more opportunities for other players in the industry if such a thing were done through the association. So I think the, the sector generally is quite vibrant, has come quite a long way. There are very interesting solutions that a number of fintechs has been, have, have launched and are currently running. 
a number of them are already profitable. Some are moving towards profitability. So I think the, the, there is a very bright future, I would say, for the fintech industry. Uh, if, if, if anything to go by is the different um, areas in which fintech has been impacting. I mean, it started with just payments, but now we've gone into insurance, education, energy, and so on. And so I think there is quite a bright future for the fintech sector. Thanks, uh, Mr. CEO. Doreen, your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, um, as MFS Africa and Bionic, we too are a proud member of, of the FITSPA Association. And we are really happy to be part of a forum where we are part of different conversations that are further enabling um, the, the deepening of, of fintech solutions and their scalability. I think the key word out of the conversation has been sustainability. And I think that's going to come with continuing to reduce the cost of operation for fintechs and continuing to support um, the scalability of some of these innovations. Uh, and so capacity building will be an important piece that I think um, there is an opportunity for more to be done by the government. And I think that with these different you know, collaborations through the FITSPA Association, we will continue to advocate for a reduction in all of these costs that are a bit prohibitive for scale. Thanks, Doreen. Nayaz, your parting words? Well, a lot has already been said. I really wanted to uh, thank and congratulate Doreen and Gerald uh, for their amazing contributions and their inspiring talk and uh, reach out for your moderation as well. Um, I think it's, it, you know, having spent some time in Uganda, I, I find that fintech ecosystem to be extremely vibrant, extremely innovative, um, and, and it's extremely forward thinking in many different ways. And we've seen a lot of developments happening. I think we're very close to actually uh, breaking another level of development with these new innovators and new generation coming up with uh, things uh, around ride hailing, around e-commerce, and many other ways in which we can support people's livelihoods, but also, as I was saying, uh, new lending uh, schemes that start incorporating additional data sets that are related to environmental impact, for instance. Um, what, what I think would be really important is for the government to start actually shaping that movement, in a sense, because there's, a, there's an organic movement of innovation that's happening that's really supporting broader development objectives. And I think if there was a set of incentives uh, policy incentives, policy stimulations, fiscal incentives. Uh, I think my, my fellow panelists, uh, Doreen and Gerald, have been speaking about the cost of operation, the cost of scaling. There's many levels at which the government can provide the right level of support and infrastructure uh, to really help those fintechs to actually take off. Uh, that would really propel Uganda into a very positive, prosperous, and sustainable future. And uh, I'd love to be there uh, to watch that and see that happen. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tayaz, and, and really to close this the way I started it, uh, with recognition of the growth of the sector, which comes with regulation and all that, comes a sense of responsibility to impact the economies within which we operate, and, and I think that's the message to the fintech sector. The discussion has given us a few pointers on what could be possible within the fintech sector to impact the economy uh, sustainably. So I'd like to thank Doreen once again from Bionic uh, MFS Africa, uh, Gerard, Gerard Begumisa from Yo Uganda, and Ayaz for joining us online from Paris. Thank you so much to the listeners online and in the room. Have a nice afternoon. Uh, um, I, I'll give a round of applause to to, to, to Richard, Gerald, and Doreen for, and Elias, who was, was joining in online for a great session, but most importantly for nailing it on the time. So, so thank you very much. I, I truly, truly appreciate.